All right, it's a new year, new you. In today's episode, we're going to talk about all the different ways that you can improve your health and fitness for this new upcoming year. Here we go. All right, let's talk about what people can do in 2024. I'm excited about this one because I think we chose to give tips that are less obvious. Yes. Right, I think that everybody knows that they need to make better food choices. Like eat better, exercise. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. I think that's the obvious stuff, but... Move I really around. like this list because I think they're they're relatively easy things that people can can tackle on a day-to-day basis and they really do start to add up and will send you in the right direction. Yeah, they're small steps that have uh, big effects. Um, and I like that, right? As trainers, that's one of the things we learn. It's like, okay, can what are the small steps people can take that'll have big returns? Because those are the ones that uh, people will be able to do. And then we're going to start to see the, them be able to move the needle versus big steps that, you know, give you very little return. That tends yeah, to gotta, discourage people. Got to hack into that human psychology to make those little behavioral changes that'll stick. So. It, it also, like having a list like this helps because there's going to be days where maybe you miss one or two things on there. But then as long as you did some of the other ones in there, you're always moving in the right direction of being a healthier version of yourself, right? So and I think that's important to teach clients this is that, you know, oh, we, we can have a day where we didn't eat the best or, you know, a vacation when you didn't get to the gym and work out. But there still are a lot of other things that we can do to move the needle in towards a healthier version of yourself. And we need to celebrate those wins and continue to compile those up. And so I like that instead of it just being black or white. I mean, I'm on my diet and I'm training and it's yeah. either I'm off or on. It's like, well, no, there's a lot of other things that we can do to improve mm-hmm. your health. Yes. All right, today's giveaway is the RGB bundle. Nine months of exercise program we're going to give to one of you for free. Here's how you can win it. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now, this episode, we talk about the things you can do in 2024 to get in the best shape of your life. One of them is to train with a plan. The same RGB bundle that I'm giving one of you listeners is going to be 50% off because of this episode. So if you don't win, you can get it for half off. And it's nine months of exercise programming. You can go get it now by clicking on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. So the first one uh, is to manage the algorithms on the media that you consume. So this one we've never really talked uh, about before. I mean, we do episodes like this almost every year where we kind of give people tips. I don't think we've ever mentioned this before. Mm -hmm. This is a big one. And the data now, we didn't have data really on how social media impacts uh, people's behaviors. Uh, We all speculated. Mm -hmm. um, And a lot of speculation. We were concerned, but it was like, yeah, it wasn't like super obvious with data. Yeah. So, But now we have data. And a lot of speculations were correct. What you watch and consume most changes and shifts your perception of yourself and your perception of the world. The most obvious one being... If you're on social media scrolling and the people that you're looking at have, you know, unattainable bodies, or let's say that their bodies are the result of unhealthy habits. Lots of people in the fitness space are like this, right? Body obsessed, um, overtrained, over dieted, um, lighting and Photoshop. And now nowadays we have AI. And if that's what you're seeing in your media feed, Uh, subconsciously, this is very powerful now, and the data shows this, subconsciously, we compare ourselves to our environment. That becomes the world you live in. So it's not the world that you see outside where you, I mean, walk around outside. Does anybody look like the people in many people's uh, social media feeds? No, No. it's super rare. In fact, (laughs) we manage gyms for a living. This is already a self-selection bias of fit people. How often in the gyms that we manage do you see people with like ripped six pack abs, yeah. right? They used Only to be specific gyms. Yeah. yeah. And, and that used to be rare. part of my presentation. I used to actually, when we, in the in Santa Teresa, we had that little sales pit with the glass window and you could see into the workout floor and I'd get people that were intimidated to come in, in the gym and stuff like that. I used to stand them up and I used to have them look and say, show me, you know, what you would consider five, you know, perfect or great fit yeah. bodies. And you couldn't get, you couldn't even find five. You're mm-hmm. in the gym and you couldn't find five super ripped people that you see on Instagram all day long through your your feed, right? Like every other picture is for people that are into health and fitness tend to have that many people popping up. It's like, that's such a rare percentage of people. It's super rare. The In fact, the statistics show that it's more common to see or meet somebody who's got a million dollars worth of wealth than to find someone with a six pack. That's how rare it is. 
But what happens when you look through your, your, your social media algorithm is that becomes the world that your brain perceives you to live in. You compare yourself to that and now you think you're terrible or that that's impossible to attain or I feel, you know, really bad about myself. I'm unattractive. Look at all these incredible people. And that can shift your behaviors in, 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 the, in the negative. It can make you train in ways that are inappropriate, uh, either training too hard or too often or to punish yourself. It could also make you eat in ways that are inappropriate. And all this leads to you eventually stopping because at some point you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. This sucks. This is terrible. And I never look like that. And what I'm doing right now isn't even working that, that, that great. And I'm doing a lot and this sucks. And I'm going to go back to what I was doing before. Another thing that you can do with your algorithm, because the brain seeks out a few different things. One of them is like extreme beauty, sex appeal. It's also being alarmed and afraid. Our brains are wired to tune into scary news because we evolved in tribes and for the most part, and you want to hear about the lion yeah. that ate George, right? Or you want to hear about- Is there a problem? I'm going to hyper-focus on Yeah, it. and you want to hear about the snake, you know, going to that cave, there's a snake in that bit, you know, that bit someone. It's like, you need to, your, our brains are wired to do that, but- now on social media, so many things are alarming and we're drawn to them. We click on them, we read them. Oh my God, did you see this thing? Look what's happening. And you have no control or no influence over these things. You have no, almost no influence over what's happening across the world or other things. And so what ends up happening is it creates this stress and anxiety and hopelessness and helplessness within yourself. And that drives your behaviors as well. So managing your algorithms to be more specific isn't just avoiding the things that I'm talking about. It's more like this consciously make the algorithm feed thing feed you in ways that are positive or that will move you in the right direction. So things that are encouraging, positive and strengthening information, connecting with other people in real ways, things that you can apply to yourself that you can learn from and be very conscious because when you scroll through social media, the al the al the apps track not just what you click on and what you comment on and what you like, but also yeah. how long you pause. On a picture versus well, just scrolling. to add to that, because you mentioned all these stressful things that um, seem pretty like normal in terms of I'm just consuming this regularly because it's on my phone and it's just like I'm feeling like I'm getting inundated with information that's useful or like I don't really see a, like a negative side to that as much until you start kind of really seeing how that's affecting your recovery, how it's affecting like your overall bucket of stress. And like, you're just carrying that with you and it rolls over into the next day. And like, you're never like really fully in that parasympathetic state when you're constantly inundating yourself with like this, this, this scroll of, of uh, news or, you know, I'm not good enough or whatever totally. it is that you're looking at. I think this is a little challenging for uh, health and fitness conscious people because our space, um, and by the way, this is a lot to do with why we choose not to do this, but our space has uh, created this like uh, bubble of fitness people that feel the need that they, they have to advertise through showing their body yeah. off. So even some of your favorite health and fitness people that are giving good health and fitness advice, potentially, uh, their feed is still... 80% of them half naked or in fitted clothes or hitting PRs in the workout floor. And this is something that we chose not to do because I, we know that this idea of other people comparing uh, to you is not an, a, an ideal way for you to pursue your fitness journey. And so I think for people that are getting to health and fitness, that this is going to be a, a little bit of a challenge for them is to be aware of that, that whether you believe it or not, subconsciously you are, if you constantly are seeing that person or them, those people, that you follow, say, 40 of your favorite fitness people, and those 40 people all put pictures of them flexing yeah. and ripped and stuff like that, even if they're good people and they have good information, you can't help it. But subconsciously, your brain starts to go, oh, this is normal. Mm -hmm. This, I, And I'm not normal because yeah. I don't look this way. And so be mindful uh, of that and you know, maybe choose to follow less of that. The other thing that I would add to this category uh, with the algorithm is is just total time. Yeah. Is, you know, the iPhone now has the ability to, you know, track for you your app time and usage and, you know, be honest with yourself. Am I, do I really need to be on Instagram for four hours of my day? You know, even if you have a business on Instagram, is it necessary to be on there for four hours? And how often is that time of you just waste mindlessly yeah. scrolling through stuff like that? How often is it intentional? Right. 
And so, you know, I think part of not only setting the algorithm is also being intentional about your usage, your total usage of it and cutting back there. I think both will serve you if you start to pay attention. Now you to have to do this consciously because they're so, they're smarter than you are. The people that make these apps and, and these social media platforms, that's why they're so popular. They're smarter than you are. So you have to be intentional. So when you go on there, say, I want to find information like this, click on it, like it hover over it, click on it, like it, hover over it. Keep doing this till the, and the algorithm, by the way, models itself very quickly. Within a day or two of doing this, your whole algorithm will, will change. And the reason why it has to be intentional is because if it's instinctual, you're going to get caught up in, and you'll see this. I've seen this myself. My algorithm will start to shift back to the alarming stuff. I'm like, oh, I'm not really paying attention. By the way, I did this experiment recently just mm -hmm. on this uh, topic. Uh, where, and my wife encouraged this, where you literally turn your phone off for one hour a day. That's it. And here's what's wild. A little bit of panic sets in. And then uh, I now I've noticed the freedom from it. I turn it off and I'm, oh my God, this kind of feels really good. Try that out. Just mm -hmm. test that on yourself and see how you feel. You might be surprised that the emotional, uh, you know, kind of roller coaster puts you on. And that's a, that's a sign right there that this is very powerful. So manage your algorithms to, feed you in a way that's going to help you move in the right direction when it comes to your, your health and fitness. The second thing is this with diet. And, I, and of course, diet's going to be a part of this, but you want to eat foods that encourage you to eat less. Okay. So here's why that's so important. When you look at the data on sugar, on inflammatory fats, on certain components of food that have been shown to have negative effects, a lot of that gets erased when the calories are low. Okay. In fact, and I, and I know I'm oversimplifying. Okay. So that's a fact, but it's, you even have people uh, who purport that calories are everything, which they are not, but they're very important. And they'll do something like, I'm going to eat an all McDonald's diet and I'm going to show you improvements in my blood numbers, my blood lipids and my markers. I'm going to show you, I'm going to lose weight. And they do. Now it's because they're carefully controlling their intake. All right. You don't want to live that way. Right. And obviously if you try to just eat McDonald's or yeah. processed foods. So they talk about their cravings that they create. Yeah, that. You're going to eat, you're going to overeat. Yeah. So try to eat foods that you know will make you want to eat less because that's the state you want to be in long term or most of the time because it's going to not feel like you're white knuckling this entire process. All right. So what are those foods? Whole natural foods, high protein foods, period, protein. end of story. Yeah. Those fiber produce the most satiety and fiber. Thank you very much. So high protein, fiber, whole natural foods, those have been shown to hit that satiety button on you very quickly, meaning it's hard to overeat in comparison to other ways of eating when you're eating a diet that's high in fiber, protein, and only whole natural foods. Take those things out, and then you're stuck with this, I got to count calories, I got to watch what I'm eating, oh my God, I overate, oh, I have all these cravings, and you're just, you're fighting this constant feeling, which uh, that's torture. And that's not going to last very long. You're going to lose that battle. This uh, this Thanksgiving, my my nephew, who's a uh, senior in high school, is really getting into weightlifting and training now. And and he was asking me lots of diet questions, right? And I asked, uh, one of the things I asked him was, you know, have you ever tracked your protein intake and hit it every day for 30 days before? And he's like, oh, 30 days? No. And I'm like, and I'm like how often do you miss days? Oh yeah. You know, I said, listen, I don't want you to do anything else. That's literally all I want you to do is hit your body weight in protein, your goal body weight where you want to be at. Right. And just focus on that. I didn't even tell him to avoid processed foods. I said, as long as you hit your protein intake, then I'll even just start there. Yeah, yeah. Just start there because what I know is going to end up happening in order to hit your your protein intake through yeah. you, through whole natural foods, you're gonna get full. You gotta allocate everything in that direction. Yeah, and I even said to him, I'm not gonna tell you, you can't enjoy that ice cream every once in a while or eat out with your buddies with that. Just make it a goal that you first hit your protein intake, okay, and then you can do those other things. And so that's our first thing, like nutritionally. And he's like, and he's asking me all these other questions about carbs and pre workout and the anabolic window no. and all this other. I said. Don't even worry about none of that yet. Just just do this. Watch what we're watch the change between that and your lifting weights because I know he's already training. He's following one of the programs. I'm like, I watch what I'm going to show you in the change in your body composition and your strength just from that, and then we'll add to that other stuff later. Now, Adam's talking about is hitting your target body weight, uh, and we say target body weight because if you're overweight and you want to lose weight, you don't want to use the current body weight. You want to use where you want to be. You hit your 
hit your target body weight in grams of protein. That's hard. I want everybody to understand this right now. It is not easy. I challenge you to do this for more than three days in a row. Watch what happens. If you're a 130 pound female or you want to weigh 130 pounds, eat 130 grams of protein day in and day out. And I promise you what you're going to end up feeling is full. You're going to say, I can't eat this much food. Now, here's what's funny about that. You'll end up eating less calories also. Yep. The pro on a gram per gram, calorie per calorie basis, protein produces the satiety of something like 20, 30% more calories. So when people hit their their targets, and pro, I mean, I used to do this with clients. This I, It took me too long to figure out. I wish I knew this. I figured this out early on. But when I would tell clients to do this, the struggle was not, I mean, early on in my career with clients, the struggle was how to get them to eat less. Oh, you overeat. Oh, you got too many cravings. Oh, I know it's really tough. You got to just have the discipline. You got to really, you know, you got to be strong. You can do this. Later, the argument or the, the the discussion was, you missed your protein. You missed, you got to eat protein. You got to miss it. And they would always tell me, I can't. Sal, I'm eating too. I can't do it. I just, I just don't want to eat anymore. And they would all get leaner as a result because it crushes, it completely crushes your appetite. The other thing that I love about that is because we've learned over all these years of training people, the psychology around not telling them they can't have something. Of course. And, that, and that's what I was doing with him was like, listen, I'm not going to tell you, you can't have your mom's favorite apple cobbler pie or whatever. I'm not going to tell you, and especially around these holidays. But what I'm going to tell you is just do this first and then, uh, then I'll allow you to have those things. But what I know ends up happening is the point you're you making. You don't want right? it. Yeah. yeah. And the people that fail at this, what they do is they hear that advice. They go, oh, wow, he's saying I can't, I can do it. And then they end up inserting that food they want in Bef the middle of the day. Before they hit their protein. Before they hit their protein yeah. intake. Then they get full then they, and then they come back and say, I've been doing what you told me and I'm just not. And I'm like, it's because you're not listening all the way here. You have to <laughs> first hit the protein intake. So if you have this food or this thing that you feel that you want so bad. Wait till you hit your target. Yeah, just make that deal with yourself. I'm not going to, I'm going to eat it later today. After I hit my protein intake, then I'll allow myself to have that and just watch what happens. Psychologically, uh, failing because you couldn't restrict yourself feels a lot worse than failing because you couldn't feed yourself more. When you're trying to lose weight, that is a very, very, there's a very big difference psychologically. One of them feels like punishment, restriction. The other one feels like, oh my God, I got to, I got to put, throw more food in my, my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. This is really tough. And it's, it's just a much better strategy. So eat in a way that'll make you naturally want to eat less protein, fiber, whole natural foods, avoid heavily processed foods. Cause those definitely will make you want to overeat. All right. The next one, lift weights with a plan. So Here's the thing. If you've listened to our show for longer than, than 15 minutes, you know that we strongly advocate for strength training. It's the most effective way in a time for time basis to change the way your body looks, improve your health, speed up your metabolism and lose pure body fat. Okay. It encourages a faster metabolism. You lose more body fat with it than other forms of exercise. And you don't need to spend as much time doing it to get those results. Most people two, three days a week and they'll get exceptional results with proper strength training. Now here's the the, the downside or maybe the perceived downside of strength training. If somebody says they're going to go run, they just go run. Mm -hmm. Someone says they're going to cycle, they're just going to go cycle. Someone says I'm going to lift weights, what do I do? Yeah. There's a thousand exercises. A thousand different ways. There's a thousand that. different ways to do each one. Not only that, what do the exercises do? How do I do them right? How do I put them together? How do I put the order. days together? What are the reps? What about sets? Yeah. How do I organize this? This, this micro cycle and then this meso cycle and then this macro cycle, like what is this all, this, this is all very complex. So you can't just go to the gym necessarily just lift heavy things without a plan. Have a plan that you can follow. The difference between just lifting and lifting with a plan is massive. It's literally, it's like the difference between walking and walking with a map. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're walking, but you ain't, you don't know if you're going the right way, the wrong way, <clears throat> if you're going up, down, left or right. If you have a plan, it makes a huge difference. And make sure you follow a plan that is well-written and well-programmed by people who actually do this for a living. Not a plan that looks like it's just flashy or it's designed to make you sweat or it's got some weird, you know, title on it. Like, you know, the one I always use, Urban Cowboy Hip Hop Workout, whatever. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Follow a very well-structured strength training plan and just stick to it. That's all. People who write these things and create these things know more than you do. And then follow it. Follow it. Yeah. You have your plan. I'm ready. 2024. This is the one I'm going to follow. Of course, we have great programs. And do that. That's the way you should live flights uh, when you follow that particular stuff. I saw a great meme that just describes everything you just said. But it's like, 
these guys that were like um, building a wall out of bricks. And it said, me and my bro, like just, you know, doing our own programming versus like, and they had another wall that was like, you know, all pristine in terms of like the spacing and everything with the brick wall. And it's like holds up. And the other one's just like all wonky and everywhere, but it's just, you can get what you want in terms of like you going in and showing up and like putting in work is going to do something, but why not have like a deliberate thoughtful plan going in? So you're actually getting that much closer to your, your desired outcome. Well, I know for our audience that we're, we've got, you know, I think seven unique good tips for people, but literally two and three was all I gave my nephew. Yeah. I literally said, you just show me, first of all, the first step, 30 days of hitting your protein intake consistently, right? String it together and just focus on that. I said, I'm going to set you up for the next nine months worth of training as far as programming, right? Like I'm going to lay out the programs for you. So Would you, you do the RGB? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Just our, 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 our core three programs that I would run 90% of my clientele through, right? Regarding that they didn't have a specific goal, right? Other than just getting stronger, fitter, right? Body composition change. I would run, I'll run you through that. You just hit your protein intake and then we'll just run. And I guarantee you, you'll be stronger than you've ever been. You'll be leaner than you've ever been. You'll be more muscular than you've ever been in your entire life just from those two things. Yep. And then, then we can get into all the other granular stuff and really start to turn the knobs. But if we haven't done that, if we haven't followed solid program, and by the way, he was already training like five days a week. And I'm like, you don't even need to do that much. I really want you to lift weights three days a week and hit the protein and take, this is what it's going to look like and just trust that part. And then I, I guarantee you're going to be happy. And hundred percent, it's going yeah, to work. Yeah. All right. The next one is really just about the, the health benefits of daily activity or really what it's really about are the health detriments of not being active every single day. And that is to walk a little bit three times a day. So no structured cardio. I'm not getting on a treadmill and sweating my butt off. I'm not trying to ride a bike for five miles. Literally three times a day, go on a, a seven to 10 minute walk. That's it. Seven to 10 minutes, three times a day. All right. What's that going to do? All right. It's not going to make you shredded, do all that stuff. But what it will do is improve your health markers. It will improve your blood insulin and glucose levels, which helps with your behaviors. It's also a moment to be reflective, do this without any distraction. And it has a profound effect on lots of other behaviors. When you divide your day up with a, like I said, literally a seven to 10 minute walk, when you divide your day up that way, morning, afternoon, and evening, here's what ends up happening. Here's what I end up finding with clients. When they do this, every time you do that walk, your behavior is a little bit better afterwards. And then it starts to kind of trend downwards, almost like it wears off. It's almost like you take a pill that gives you better behaviors, but the half-life is very short, a few hours, right? Then you get the next walk. Oh, here we go. I'm doing it again. Nice self-reflective walk, no distractions, or maybe listen to a good book. That's good too, but I like no distractions. And now it gets you up again and then it kind of veers off a little bit. And then do one more in the evening to finish off the day. Increases activity, that's true, but really what it does is it improves your behaviors and it helps with your overall health. And again, it's less to do about the walking yeah. and more to do with the fact that it's we lead such sedentary life, life uh, lifestyles mm -hmm. that the little bit of activity is profoundly beneficial because of how unhealthy the fact is that we don't move at all. And I love pairing them after meals, which we've yes. talked about and mainly the digestion in terms of like the improved digestion uh, for myself uh, and my clients. Um, I just feel like the majority of people have gut issues and that's just something I've noticed mm -hmm. over the years is like so many people, whether they know it or not um, have a lot of digestive issues that, they could actually work on and improve through obviously better nutritional choices, but then two, uh, allowing their body this proper time to digest and and to create that movement and get all the systems working effectively. And th this is a, a great way to do that while also getting sun and getting fresh air and a lot of other benefits all kind of combined at once. Well, yeah. I think one of the worst habits that we ever created was the you know, eat a big meal and then plop your feet up on the couch and, mm -hmm. and watch a movie or on TV and stuff. And I think that that's pretty common in, in not only in my own household, but in most households I've been in is that that's kind of what happens. Like everybody sits around the dinner table or eats lunch. And then afterwards they put their feet up and they watch a movie or relax. And it's like, man, you're, you will see just, and then this is, a, I love 
just so, taking somebody who's eight and and done that for most of their life and just getting the walk to minutes, how much better they Huge. instantly feel. Yep. It's because it's just your digestive system was not meant to lay down flat like that after getting a big meal like that. Gravity works no, in your yeah. favor. When no, you're in standing fact, up. when you're actually, when you're walking, obviously the muscles of your lower body are contracting and then relaxing. This act like a sponge. It moves and it they along. soak up. They soak up the blood sugar that you have in your blood. So now you have better blood sugar levels. Partition everything your, better. Your insulin now because you 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 don't have insulin sensitivity issues because you're. You're like a, like it's like a sponge. Think of a sponge. You put in water, you squeeze it, and then you open it, and it sucks things up. That's what happens. The second thing you talk about digestion, hip flexor muscles and muscles that aid in in locomotion, right? Lower body movement. Some of these muscles go through the digestive system. I mean, almost like you look at a psoas muscle. It's a hip flexor. It goes through the body and attaches at the lumbar spine. Every time that shortens and contracts, it actually aids in the digestive process. It actually helps with yeah. with the, with food moving through and um, gravity and, gra and, and standing up. Yeah, just pulling it down. That 100%. period. And it's so I like this one because it's so easy. Yes, a seven to ten minute walk is like for most people is down the street and back. Mm -hmm. So and, oh, you finish eating down the street and, back. and for I mean I been talking about this for quite some time now i think and we one of the best benefits is just the connection with your partner so yeah. i'm a big fan of mm -hmm. this is another time when you decide to put the phone away and any sort of distraction and it's an opportunity for you to connect with a <clears throat> you know a partner spouse a child whatever like this is just we live in a time now where we always have our phones in our hands or in our hip like we're constantly attached to it it's rarely ever do you have two or three people in the same room and then one of them not always grabbing on their phone so here's an opportunity for you to connect with the people that you love by putting those away walking for 10 minutes improving digestion moving a little bit burning a little bit extra calories and then also connecting with people because i think it's an important part of health totally too. all right this next one is uh i, I really like this one because this is one of those like like many of these where if you follow it there's all these like kind of domino effects on other behaviors and that's really what makes it so beneficial and, and that is to set a water goal and hit it so uh for most people most of the clients i trained I would have them aim for a half a gallon to a gallon of water every single day. Now, the bigger the person, the more that they sweat, the more protein that they consume, the more uh, water I'd have them, uh, you know, target. But half a gallon to a gallon a day. I like a gallon for most people because most people end up going just short of it because that's tough, right? And make sure it's spring water. You don't want anything distilled or without any minerals or anything like that in it. But only because a lot of water without those minerals can cause uh, you know, actual muscle cramping and stuff like that. But Set a target. So what this looks like is get yourself a bottle that you could fill up with water and, and, and realize or notice how many of those bottles are required to be, let's say your target is a gallon. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a, it's four of those. So four of these thermos bottles equals a gallon and then track them throughout the day and try to hit those targets every single day. Here's what you'll find. Yeah. You'll drink less of other calorie containing beverages. That's the big yeah. one. Two, you have more energy, less pain, less pain, less inflammation, yeah, less tightness, uh, less tightness. Your appetite actually uh, is positively affected in less the sense brain that brain fog, less brain fog. This is a, especially if you're a busy, stress stressed out person. I mean, how many times have, have people? How many times have you know you watching this right now? Have you said this to yourself? Oh, I forgot to drink today. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, I haven't drank any water today. It's already three o'clock. Literally, it's just set it set a goal. Have that water with you throughout the day. Hit that water target. Watch what happens, how you feel. This is one of my favorite ones to hear you give as a tip because people that have been listening to the show long enough might remember back in the days, the guys used to tease me for carrying around a one gallon jug. Oh uh, yeah. And we, this was actually, mark it off, uh -huh. this was, yeah. and I actually used to teach my clients to do the same thing. So it was kind of funny. I know what the guys were, were teasing about. They were making fun of the, the gym bro with his, his gallon of, of water and his, you know, 50 supplements. Well, and, it was, it was a Barbie jug that you yeah, had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this was, uh, cool now. this was my argument that I made back then. I said, no, I disagree with you guys. I actually think that, that it does have some validity to it. In fact, I used to tell my clients to do it. Um, for this exact reason, because if you tell someone to drink eight glasses of water, n ain't none of them track. I mean, none of them count. It's too many to keep track. Yeah, or, or they start counting and then they forget and then they just write off. Yeah. Where having that gallon with a, a line marked on it, so let's say you're three quarters a gallon or a full gallon, which is what I would give most of my clients as a goal, is they can visually see it. 
Yeah. They, and they know. There's no question. Simple. Is there's no question. Did I drink three of those yet, or two of those? I can't remember. Was it the fourth one I did? No. It's like there's your gallon. You started this morning. It's only that far down. And like, and then I, I'd have clients even mark because they started to learn. Oh, after over time, like where they needed to be by a certain time, and they would put oh noon. They'd put a line where they need yeah. to be, and then four o'clock in the afternoon where they need. So yeah, because you don't want to be caught at the end of the day. With no, you're just not going to make it. Yeah. You're not going to make it, and or you're not going to track it. And so I've always been a fan of this. And the things that I found, I mean, ironically, you get up and move, and you have to pee more. So you get up and you get those yeah. little five ten minute walks naturally because you have to go to the, the restroom all the time. Burning when calories. you're a lot of times uh, when the the signals that we have of cravings and hunger, a lot of times is triggered by dehydration of our mm -hmm. having and going over and just having some some liquid or fluid will help you. It also help you from overeating. So like if you have a good glass or you're drinking water between bites, you'll see that you don't over, over consume. Uh, so there's, a, there's a lot of benefits to doing that besides just the fact that we need to stay hydrated and that's a healthy thing for you. So it's one of my favorite easy it's hacks. It's a simple one too. Yes. Very it's a simple. simple one. All right. Next is to train and eat to feel good, not to look good. All right. So why is this such an important one. Well, first off, there's nothing wrong with working out and eating to change how you look, but here's the problem with it. Okay. It's not inherently bad or inherently wrong, but when you're training and when, when what's directing your workouts and your diet is the reflection in the mirror, you're far more likely to make decisions that are not good for you or not beneficial or appropriate versus when you're working out and eating to feel good. So what do I mean by that? Well, if it's all about what the scale says and the mirror says, which of course is very subjective, so is feeling is very subjective, but boy, can the mirror be uh, quite an evil, subjective, um, you know, enemy. When you're doing it that way and all of a sudden you look at the mirror, oh, I don't, uh oh, am I puffy today? Am I a little heavy? Or I don't see that bicep vein or whatever. Then you're more likely to ignore the signs of your body. You feel bad. I'm going to the gym anyway. I, I, I'm supposed to have an easy workout today, but I'm going to beat myself up anyway. Um, or I'm going to force myself to eat this way because I hate the way I look type of deal. And then you develop this kind of bad relationship with food, which eventually you rebel from versus how do I feel? Well, I feel energized. I'm going to have a hard workout or I feel tired. You know what? I'm going to go easy to my workout or I'm stiff. You know what? Today's a mobility day. I'm not going to do the, the heavy lifting or diet. Hey, I know I'm supposed to eat this particular way to lose weight or to whatever, but my digestion's off. So I really need to shift to these foods that help my digestion or these foods that help my energy or these foods that help my, my mood because I notice when I eat this other way, I get moody. If you train and eat to feel good, and I mean the truest sense, to feel good, not just the impulsive hedonistic feel good that we'll get temporarily, but the actual true feeling good, you're more likely to make the right decisions. And those decisions are more likely to make you look good. So the irony of what I'm saying is you'll look good, we're more likely to look good if you do this to feel good versus the other way around. Yeah, the more in tune you are with your body's natural signals, the better you're going to recover and then adapt and move forward in your progress. And, and that's like a really hard concept for people because to Adam's point always, it's like this, like it doesn't make sense in any other uh, thing or pursuit that you do in terms of my work um, that I'm, I'm pursuing to be the best at or um, you know, learning the more than anybody else I put in like nothing but hard work and then it pays off. And, um, and this is just one of those things that you have to really listen to your body's ability to, to communicate with you as to whether or not I feel tight, restricted, whether I feel like I have zero energy, whether I feel like I just, you know, maybe, maybe I can get after it and go a little more intense right now. Like you, you got to really pick, pick up on those signals and peer into that because that's really where, um, you know, it's not going to lead you astray. So to, to do that, a lot of times, you know, if you're just looking at the mirror, you're just looking at this visual uh, perception of yourself, like it's not going to tell you uh, the whole story. A lot of times it's, it's, it's going to uh, create this idea that I need to, to go harder and I'm going to train hard, which then you're going to interrupt your recovery, which then puts you in this well, sort of hamster. Along room. those lines, your body doesn't communicate to you through the mirror, nor the scale. Your body communicates to you by the way you feel. So if you want to listen to your body, basing it off of how you look is not listening to your body. In fact, it's ignoring. It's actually encouraging to ignore what your body's telling you. Well, the reason why this is such a good tip is, and we actually just recently talked about this, You, no matter what, you eventually have to move this way. 
right? You don't have to tell anybody who's just getting started on their journey that how to motivate them to want to look better. Most people come into the gym that way. Almost all of us were motivated because I want to look better and that's why I'm here. Like that's easy. Most people feel that already. But if you want this to be sustainable long term and you want to continue this as a as a as a lifestyle, you'll have to move away from just the way you look to learning all these other things, which is why we always teach our clients to, to start looking at these things. It's like, yes, I know you want to lose 100 pounds. Yes, I know you want to look like a certain way that you used to look before or whatever. But I also want you to be connected to your sleep, your mood, your libido, your hair, your skin, your energy level, like all these other things you've got to learn to be connected to because those are the things that are after you get and obtain this look that you want, like that's what's going to sustain you long term. And you're better off learning to connect the foods and the way you eat to how those things make you feel better because it's going to be more sustainable. Also, if you're going into 2024 and you, I mean, if you had everything identical, two people identical, identical, identical situations, one listened to how their body felt. The other one just looked at the mirror and chased the look. At the end of that year, the person who chased the feeling good would look better. Yep. So it's also the faster, better way to get there. Right. So that's the kicker. All right, the last one has to do with sleep. Obviously, sleep's important. The data on sleep is, uh, I mean, it's unequivocal. It's, it, it's very, very important for health, behaviors, fat loss, muscle gain, hormones. But there's a lot of things we can do to improve our sleep, or there's a lot of knobs we can turn to try to improve our sleep. But one of them, or many of them, have big effects. Others have much smaller effects, right? Like smaller effect, blue light blocking glasses before you go to bed. Everybody talks about that. What's the effect? That's eh, you get an effect, but it's not this big, profound one. Well, when you look at the data on sleep, it's now becoming quite clear that there's something that almost everybody does that has profoundly negative effects on the quality of their sleep, and that's the following: they go to bed at the same time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. They go to bed late. They try to sleep in Saturday. They go to bed late Saturday. They try to sleep in Sunday. They go to bed Sunday. Now I got to wake up early again on Monday, and they're giving themselves jet lag. Every single week, jet lag. every single week, every week, people's circadian rhythms are forced to shift. The data on changing your circadian rhythm on people that travel often, on people that work swing shifts is clear. It's terrible for health, terrible for hormones, terrible for muscle building, terrible for fat loss. It's not good for anything. So one of the best, most profound things you could do with the big impact when it comes to sleep is simply this, this right here. You don't have to do anything else but this, and you'll have a big impact. Go to bed at the same time every night and wake up at the same time every day. If you just did that, most people would see incredible incredible improvements in their sleep quality and the benefits that come along with that. This one hits home for me mm -hmm. so much right now because more, more than ever have I hopped around time zones. Right? I think we were in four different time zones oh, yeah. over the last month, right? which I don't think that's ever happened to me where I've been in four different time zones in one month. Actually, it was in two and a half weeks. And I've had the hardest time getting back to my sleep routine and my training routine because of that. Like I can't remember the last time that I struggled to like really get good night's rest consistently for two or three days and get my training back. Mm -hmm. And so this is, it, to me, it's just this, this is this microcosm of what happens to some people that are constantly traveling or stay up till two in the morning one time and then go to bed at eight o'clock another time and then like up early and then up later. Like, man, I can only imagine doing that and then also trying to be consistent with my nutrition and training because I can feel what that feels like right now. And I'm like, God, that would be so difficult. So this is such a good tip uh, because you don't realize how much how much more difficult you make it for yourself. It's not like you can't get shredded and fit and be inconsistent about your bedtime, just that you make it a lot harder for yourself mm -hmm. by doing that. A lot harder. And this is why everybody hates Mondays is because they literally <laughs> shifted their circadian rhythm over the weekend and then forced it to go back. Yeah. And they're jet lagged. They feel like Another absolute. case of the Mondays. And they feel like absolute garbage. All right, look, here's the deal. We talked about strength training with a plan. That's the one thing we definitely can help you with. So we have something called the RGB bundle. This is three workout programs you follow in sequence. MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic. This is roughly nine months of planned out programming. Literally, you just follow the programs as they're laid out. And you now have exceptional strength training, programming that you can follow. And what we're doing because of this episode is we're making the RGB bundle 50% off. So it's half off right now because of this episode. So if you're interested, go to MAPSFitnessProducts.com. Sorry, go to MAPSDecember.com. 
rgbfitness.com and then use the coupon code RGB50 for that 50% off discount. 